when I came over here, I was, oh God, I was in my, my uh, mid-twenties. Right. The first time I really came over here. You know, I had a whole bunch of weird paranoid suspicions about what the hell was going on because there was a lot of stuff I couldn't understand. Right. Um, and nobody was really bothering to explain it to me. They don't. <clears throat> and, it, it, and I formed a bunch of opinions about the town and about the people in it that were like, surely that couldn't be because that couldn't be the reason for why so-and-so was acting like, could it? Mm. And then you find out later on the track that you are exactly on track. Mm. Welcome back family, AVS here and today I have an absolutely explosive episode because there have been clips of Mel Gibson floating around from a very old interview where he claims to have encountered the Antichrist and he also goes into some details about Hollywood and what the industry is actually like. Now I have actually managed to find the entire interview and I'm going to play that for you shortly. But before we get to it, I want you to remember who this man is. He is an actor, a director and a producer of one of the biggest Christian movies ever, The Passion of Christ. Now in the exclusive interview that I'm about to show you, Mel Gibson exposes some shocking truths about the entertainment industry that only somebody who has been there themselves can speak about and actually be taken seriously about it. And he speaks about the ugly reality behind Hollywood, behind all of the glamour, if you want to call it that. But that's not all. In this jaw-dropping interview, he speaks about the Antichrist, and he also speaks about a very dark situation that he experiences with one specific actor. And I won't ruin it for you, I'll let you watch the interview for yourself. But pay attention to the wording that he uses throughout the interview, it's very very interesting. And this can be very eye-opening for anybody who's trying to get into that industry. Maybe this will wake you up and turn you off of getting into that world, to be honest. But without any further ado, sit back, relax, and enjoy the interview. What were your options at the, you know, when you were 18 in terms of what you might do with your life? Well, I had absolutely no idea. And, oh. and uh, my options were, um, you know, get some quick, fast job, probably physical labor mm -hmm. to, um, you know, to earn the bread. And, Where and were you? In Australia. Okay. I had uh, an opportunity of going to university. I'd finished high school, did average. Mm -hmm but passed, really hated school. Um, um, and I could have gone into journalism or um, the other option that was open to me was a sort of auditioning for, for a drama school, right? Which, which I did. I could tell jokes yeah. and, and stories and, uh, and make stories up and convince people of things that weren't true. You were a liar. Kind of, yeah, yeah. A, a great liar. Yeah. Yeah, a good liar. Yeah. I'm not as good a liar now as I was then. Yeah. Because it's, <clears throat> you know, the lying thing is uh, something you have to try and overcome, I guess. Mm, sure. And I try and put it into a, a framework where I can call it a profession now, mm. which is... Uh, it's called acting. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I can't say that I have a method. No. I, I, don't, I don't think I do. I mean, there is method, but I find that it constantly shifts and changes, and I think that that's a good thing. I'm not sure. I... Mm. I um, I was uh, educated in, in the way of uh, uh, theater craft and stuff was a very British way of right. doing things, which meant technique. Uh, technique yeah. yeah, they're all in favor of actually feeling a real emotion and, and doing that. Yeah. Uh, but they just say you are not going to be able to summon that every time, and if you even if you could summon that every time, you would you would die young. Yeah. Um, so that uh, you have to be able to at least fake it well. Mm. How do you deal with actors on that way? Um, well, you, you choose the ones who you want to be with mm -hmm. uh, for a start. I never make them read or anything. I, no. I just, I, I doubt that you do either. No, I, I don't like it. I, I don't understand that. I get that. embarrassed. I get embarrassed. And when they cry in a reading, I get like, oh, God. Uh, it's, yeah. Oh, you know. you, you want to go and... You want to leave because you feel you shouldn't be there. Well, it seems like you're doing something terribly wrong. You feel like some mm -hmm. kind of a, you know, I mean, you feel as if you're... You're committing a crime. Yeah. And it's it's kind of slimy. It's it's kind of prostitution. Sure. And and it and and 
but that I think is even beyond. It's it's just kind of watching someone uh, go through the act of prostituting themselves. Mm. Is kind of, it, it, it's there's something very un, almost unbearable about it. I find it. A lot, all the actresses I've spoken to uh, all, all, without prompting, come up with the same thing of how detestable is the casting process. Mm. Not the old casting couch thing, just the thing of not having someone good to read with, mm -hmm. you know, and, and being expected to come in and emote and look sexy and the whole thing in front of a bunch of strangers. It's not fair. It's perverse. Well, it's not fair on them either. No. It's, it's, it's asking them to do something And you don't find out anything you from it. Nothing. You find out nothing from it. This is the main reason why I really hate it. Uh, you can get them in there and somebody might do just a slap up job for that day, but that's what they've aimed at that mm -hmm. day. They, you're not, you have to be able to figure out whether they're going to be any good for three months while you're working with them. Mm. And, and the best way to do that is to get them in the room, sit them down, um, and it may be uncomfortable, as it always is getting to know someone to begin with. And they think they're going to have to read. So you tell them, well, to begin with, I don't want you to read anything. And they, and they sort of relax a little. Mm -hmm. And you say, no, no, I, I'm not making anybody read. So they don't feel like they're being Cross. outcast. No, that's the big thing, yeah. And, uh, and I don't think it tells you anything except the fact that, well, hey, they can read. I was fortunate. I only had to do it one time, ever. As an actor? As an actor, when I was starting out on a career, I only had to do it once because I was really bad at it. Mm. I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. What happened was, it was I went into this place and it was. Uh, the guy said, "Read this. Uh, can you memorize this in like um, ten minutes and come back and do it?" Mm -hmm. And he gave me this uh, script with. Uh, I mean, it was like two full pages of like complete, like a soliloquy, like mm. a dialogue. Not well written either. No. I said, just give me a little hint about who this guy is and why he's saying this stuff. So they gave me a, like a thumbnail, mm -hmm. and I thought, okay. So I went into the next room, and you know, I tried to comprehend it as best I could, and then um, I just came back. They turned a video camera on me, and I just sat there and tried to do it. I couldn't. Mm -hmm. I didn't do it according to the the page or anything, but I just started off and improvised the whole thing around it, mm -hmm. which is all you could do in ten minutes. I mean. And got the job? Got it, yeah. Uh -huh. I was so far away from the, the technical aspects of reading and doing things within a, some parameter that is given in audition processes that I thought it was hopeless anyway, so I got threw it away and was relaxed. Yeah. And that's the best way to find out whether or not this actor, actress will suit your requirement is to have them relax. Mm. And then you can talk about weather yeah. and you'll know within 15 minutes. If this is a person you want to work with. Mm -hmm. yeah. Christopher Walken, one, first time I ever did a casting session in America, yeah. terrified me. Me too. I mean, I'd, fucking hell, I came I'd, to meet the guy. They said, oh, he's flying, he's flying in from God knows where, Yeah, but he miles. didn't need a plane, right? <laughs> yeah, it's like, <laughs> he didn't need a plane. He came in, he was doing all the kind of Scorsese oh. stuff. And I said, have you had a chance to read the script? And he looked at me and he said, do you like my face? And I went, yes. And he said, well, that's great, because if you don't, get uh, De Niro, cue I'm out of here. And stood up and walked out. And everyone said, well, that I think was quite a good meeting. No, he came to see me on a rooftop in New York. I said, hey, can I, can I talk to you? And he said, sure. And he, he floated in mm. sideways mm. through a crowd of people. He was wearing black. And it was like one of those old vampire movies where they don't walk, but they glide. Mm. And he was a dancer, you know, so he has yeah, very, yeah. he's very... Um, um, you know, graceful. Yeah. And he moved sideways and he just sat down in the chair next to me. And it kind of frightened me. Mm. Um, and he's a very smart guy. Mm. And we started talking and I didn't, you know, say much of anything about reading the script, nothing. I just started talking about the Middle Ages. And, mm. and, he, um, and he began to talk tortures. <laughs> and we swapped tortures because I'd read this book on torture. Mm. And, and I... I tried to recall some of the most heinous things I'd ever read in this book, and and he was like, oh, oh, and he'd try and top it, <laughs> and it, it got, and my assistant was there, and he left because he he couldn't stand it anymore. Yeah, the the air had turned cold, mm -hmm. and then he left, and I I wanted to leave, <laughs> and because I knew that I didn't want to work with him. Yeah, and he was getting scary. Yeah, 
And then I turned around and it was on top of the Peninsula Hotel. I turned around to avoid his steady gaze at one point. Yeah. And I was looking at a building with the top of the sixes on it. So there was a huge illuminated triple six, six in red. Yeah. And I went from that to that to that and he, st he started smiling. Yeah. And I thought, oh no, Chris Walken is the Antichrist, yeah. you know? <laughs> You do, there are certain trends that seem to kind of float together, which is and one of the questions that keeps coming up is, why are there no decent parts for women? Mm -hmm. uh, why are actresses, why are women just completely underused in storytelling yeah. within this system known as Hollywood? Yeah. Any thoughts on that? Well, I think the storytelling has always been a kind of a, a, a male medium. Mm -hmm. um, always in history? Always. Yeah. From the start. Uh -huh. They were the guys who did. I mean, women just think differently to us, and that's a good thing. And there are things about the way they think and about the way they look at things that we cannot possibly understand. In fact, it's far be above us, beyond us, to, to try and like get a hook on it. Because I've tried, and I'm, you know, I'm a little wiser because I can kind of allow for it more now because I understand that it exists. But totally understanding it, I will never. Mm -hmm. And and. I think the, the the male of the species um, is more adept at at, um, at the telling of a story. That's why you go to any bar. It's not women telling jokes. Mm -hmm. It's guys telling jokes. Right. Women are notoriously bad joke tellers, most of them. Some of them are good. Mm -hmm. Some of them have a capacity for it. But I think uh, just generally, I think... Um, Men are better at it, at telling stories, and when they tell a story, they have to, it has to issue from themselves and their own experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very hard if most of the storytellers around are men to actually have a good story about a woman. Right. I think. It's, it's done. It's done pretty well at times. Uh, Even if we go back to, say, the 40s, 50s, yeah. <clears throat> early 60s, just of cinema, forget literature, um, although the balance would have been still in the favor of, of men in yeah. terms of just number of roles and so on, uh -huh. there were far more, I mean, there were some very powerful actresses uh -huh. who were taken incredibly, in terms of box office, were right. taken as seriously as, as men. And, like um, Joan Crawford. Exactly. Right? any number of them actually yeah. you know but she used to she used to display a male point of view mm -hmm. it's very interesting she was very masculine on screen right and is it that women are trying they're saying the parts aren't good because they're not masculine I'm, I'm never quite sure about that if you look at at the you know the scripts that are floating around right now mm -hmm. and the movies that are being made <clears throat> they're woefully short on, on interesting female parts. Yes, they Women are. tend to kind of pop up and sort of endorse men, uh, take their clothes off if they're in a good enough shape, and yeah. leave. Yeah. Um, and uh, one of the actresses I spoke to, actually, I came up with what I thought was, was a pretty smart thing, which was saying, I said, at what point do you, do you see the decline in women's roles? He said, the moment women took their clothes off yeah. and it became a given. Yeah. Then uh, seemed to be a lack of respect and a dropping off of interest in other other points of interest about women. You know, there's a producer I know, successful producer. I I will not mention names, but mm. his whole um, um, opinion about women on film, from beginning to end, is very brief. He says, "Women on film, either naked or dead. Both is better." Mm. And it's like, whoa, mm -hmm. whoa. The man is, has got a spiritual malady for a start. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> the scary thing is that I think a lot of people think that. Mm. Maybe not to that extreme. Mm. <clears throat> there are people, well-meaning people, that, and you find that the woman and the woman's role in a film becomes some sort of just appendage to the man. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, can, I can see why they're not too fulfilled in, in, in doing that. You're here, basically, right? You live here. Most of the, of the time, yeah, now. yeah, really. Um, I guess, yeah, yeah. I integrated. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's, it's pretty much based on money. The system here. It is. Yeah. The system is completely based on money. Yeah. Uh, the studio system. Yeah. Uh, to a degree, I think, the way I hook into the system is based on money. Yeah. 
Um, I mean, you've managed, you've, you're a rare bird. You've, we still think of you as, as an actor. But in fact, that's just quite a small part of what you do now, isn't it? Uh, yeah. It's the part... I, I, I mean, I was, when I found, when somebody told me just how many movies you'd produced, I was, I was stunned. I mean, you, you turn over, don't you? Quite a few. I mean, uh, we're pretty prolific for a perceived vanity company, right. which uh, I think a lot of people start film companies and then they, sure. they don't really do anything with them. But this is <clears throat> gets into the act sometimes, not always successfully either. Yeah. I mean, we've made some, t some horrible little pictures, but we've made some good ones too. Yeah. And um, so that, that's, there's a pride in that, and I enjoy doing that. Yeah. And How I active are you? Pretty active. You've got a good team, haven't you? Yeah, I think yeah. The, the, there's a lot of people here with a, with good heads on their shoulders, yeah. um, and nobody's immune from making a mistake. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we make plenty of them. We call them school fees. Do you? School fees. Every time we get ripped off, or yeah, um, or make a big mistake, or you know where it's and it costs you. Yeah. And you think, oh, it cost you two million or four million. So when you get a project yeah. that you're gonna, that your company's gonna do, mm -hmm. do, you, do they vary? Are some ones that you just think are just should be made as a film, or is it pretty much financially based? Your judgment? No, it's not solely financially based. Mm. Um, I think that there's an art in marrying the two. Sure, yeah. And and uh, I I if you can find that balance and satisfy both requirements, then you are successful within the industry. Right. It doesn't mean. You're not successful yeah. if you don't meet one of those requirements. You're just successful within this industry. Um. So what would you say was the good news about Hollywood right now, being very actively in the middle of it? I think... What's right about it? The best thing about it is that, um, you know, I, I grew up, and I guess you grew up in an industry that happened somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And I succumb to the charm of film and filmmaking, and and uh, um, and I love it, mm -hmm. and I love telling a story, and I love everything about it. Mm -hmm. Even the crappy things about it, I kind of like. Mm -hmm. um, and it it kind of, I guess, it gets almost to a question of like kind of a religion. Mm -hmm. Mecca for filmmakers is this industry here. Mm. It's where there's the biggest pool. It's wherever it's the watering hole where everyone comes to see, to measure up, mm. to include themselves in the pool, mm. their talent, and that collective uh, thing. It, it, it's like you go to the smorgasbord to feed your um, your need to work and your need to tell stories and your need to express yourself, whatever form. Is, it is takes. there a collective uh, ethos or? Um, Somebody once said my problem was I didn't understand the social contract here. I now understand what that means. Yeah. Do you understand it? The social contract? Yeah. I, th I think I do. Yeah. What uh, is it for you? Uh, the social contract. You can't get mad. Mm -hmm. You can't get mad. You can't let it get you. Because you have to, have, you have to make a deal with everyone else, and it's almost unspoken that you are going to be fucked over at some point by people who you may have done something nice for. Mm. And it may happen that by circumstance, or even very purposefully, that you fuck someone over. But that shouldn't get in the way of you being able to sit down and have fun with them. <laughs> you, am I on the right track? <laughs> Absolutely. You, you can't build a resentment about it. Mm -hmm. You have to still try and love those people. Yeah. Because that's the way they're thinking. Because it ain't personal. No, it's not personal. They don't really mean to hurt you. No. Not really. I don't quite understand. Well, I mean, there's a lot of motivations for why it sure. happens. Yes, many. I mean, money will make you do stuff as well, won't it? I mean, yes. one, them, us, yes. you know. Yeah, well, yeah. whoever. If there's many millions riding on a decision, it's hard to be philosophical. Yes. Yeah. yeah, very, very yeah. hard. Very hard to be, you know, you, 
<laughs> you have to choose what level of integrity you're coming in at. And okay. Uh, and I've often felt it. I've sat there, and I have felt the knife slipped firmly in between my shoulder blades and tried to have it shoved through the other side through my heart. And I've actually felt the whole thing, and I've gone, ah! Uh, mm. Wait till next week, you know? Or I'll think, you, and, for, and you'll resent it for a little while, mm. then you have to let it go. Otherwise, you'll, you'll eat yourself alive here. Mm. And I think it takes that kind of cockroach resilience to survive in this town. I mean, this is a bizarre place. Um, and it doesn't take very long, if, if, and I'm sure you've experienced this if you've stayed here for any length of time. You come in, you're fresh from the outside, you're off the boat from the farm, still got on your shoes, you're in here, people are charmed by that, mm. that you've still got on your shoes. Uh, they're charmed by the fresh approach you bring to it, and that's a real thing. Mm -hmm. But they're also stroking the shit out of you, you know, mm -hmm. licking you all over. And that's kind of good for you, too. That's great. But it doesn't take very long before you realize, or before it gets to you, it's cascading on you all the time. You can't get away from certain attitudes, from certain modes of behavior that this town and the industry dictate. And no matter how strong you are, when you come in off the farm mm. with those convictions and those and a certain line of attack, no matter how strong you are, you are going to be affected by this place. Mm. No, I've, I've, it's going to divert you from where you were going. Sure. You're going to be diverted. Mm. When I came over here, I was, oh God, I was in my, my uh, mid-twenties. Right. The first time I really came over here. You know, I had a whole bunch of weird paranoid suspicions about what the hell was going on because there was a lot of stuff I couldn't understand. Right. Um, and nobody was really bothering to explain it to me. They don't. <clears throat> and, it, it, and I formed a bunch of opinions about the town and about the people in it that were like, surely that couldn't be because a whole place can't be like, you know, weird town, you know, where the stranger wanders in and, and all the people are in the bar and they all shut up when he looks at them and, mm -hmm. and they tell you don't go out of the house on the hill. and It's like that. Mm -hmm. And then you go away and you think, no, that's, I was wrong. I mean, that's insane thinking. I'm paranoid. I imagined that stuff. That couldn't be the reason for why so-and-so was acting like could it? Mm. And then you find out later on the track that you are exactly on track mm. with a lot of this stuff. Not specifically on no, track, no. but that you could, uh, that some of your worst nightmares <laughs> were real at the time. And you think, <gasps> mm. now this is what I mean by actually starting to swim up or downstream with the rest of the salmon, mm. you know, eventually if you stay here long enough. Yeah. You'll find yourself doing that. Um, and you have to. There's a way of doing it without doing it. Mm. That takes time. Mm. Uh, and it takes relaxation. Mm. Not being uncomfortable about... Not being uncomfortable. Realizing it for what it is. Projecting. N understanding what it is. Once you understand it, well, then you're not afraid of it anymore. Mm -hmm. So you can just walk around it and through it. And, mm -hmm. and then get on with what you tried to get on with in the first place. A place like this can humiliate you, mm -hmm. and it can be, it can either, it can humiliate you, it can be humbling. I mean, it, it does rip your life to pieces does it? if you'll let it. Yeah. And it's always pounding at the walls. It's yeah. the, these little guys, these little heathens with no soul downstairs with horns on their head with a battering ram trying to like beat your walls in. Yeah. But that's your own devils, you know? Yeah. I mean, as a matter of interest, do you think it's easier because you're an outsider who came in? I think so. Yeah. Because it was glaring to me because I was an outsider who came in. But who isn't an outsider yeah. coming into this? Our tape's coming to an end, so oh. I just want to ask you a couple of um, stupid questions. <clears throat> just really quick off the top of your head, give me five movies that you like. Not the best in the world, just... Five movies I like. I hate this question. I can never answer it. Okay. I'll never be able to do it in the time allotted. Okay. 
Thanks, man. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> There you go, family. Let me know in the comments section what you believe about Hollywood. Do you believe that it really is the way that he explained it? Or maybe even worse? Let me know in the comment section below. And that's what I wanted to show you today. If you enjoy my content, make sure you do smash that thumbs up button, subscribe and turn on the notification bell. That way you get notified every time I upload a new video. Big shout out to the channel members, the financial supporters of my content. Thank you so much. It really does go a long way. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you to everybody who's consistently positive, kind and uplifting and motivating within the comment section below. I greatly, greatly appreciate you. Without any further ado, I mean, you know, not without any further ado. What I mean is, um, that being said, I pray you all have a beautiful day. May Yah shine his face upon you always and give you peace. And I'll see you on the next one. Shalom. Shalom.